Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so welcome to this month's RADNET seminar. Uh, I'm Lucy. I'm one of the I'm a senior research fellow within the Paranello Lab at the UCL Cancer Institute, uh, where my work is largely focused on understanding the interaction between cell lineage states and radiosensitivity in glioblastoma. Um, so thank you for joining today and thank you, Frank, for accepting the invite to speak. Um, so this seminar series is really intended to um, initiate connectivity, uh, to give insight into new radiation research development, mm -hmm. and uh, to hopefully allow us to build new collaborations. Um, so we have the pleasure today for, of hearing from Frank, Frank Fanari, who is a professor at the Ludwig, Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research at San, in San Diego, who will talk to us about radiosensitizing glioma through disruption of P10 nuclear function. Um, so by way of introduction, um, Professor Fanari earned his PhD in microbiology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he studied cis elements transacting and transacting um, uh, regular uh, factors regulating expression of Epstein-Barr virus, lytic replication genes. Uh, he subsequently joined the Ludwig Institute in San Diego as a postdoctoral fellow where he focused on genetic alterations that drive genesis of glioblastomas, notably the, uh, the commonly amplified EGFR v3 and mutations in the P P10 gene. Um, during this time, he was credited with seminal work demonstrating the ability of P10 to suppress glioma cell growth uh, mediated through the enzyme's lipid phosphatase activity. Uh, so he's currently member and head of the Laboratory for Tumor Biology at the Ludwig Institute, as well as Professor of Medicine at UCSD. Um, and his lab has made significant contributions uh, to our fundamental understanding of the mechanisms underlying therapeutic resistance in glioma, um, functionality of tumor heterogeneity, as well as the evolution of adult and pediatric brain tumors through genetic engineering of human pluripotent stem cell derived avatar models. Um, so in recognition of his contribution to this field, um, he is, is highlighted by scholar awards from the B. Kimmel and Goldhirsch Foundations, awards um, for basic translational research from the Society of Neuro-Oncology and by his service as associate editor for Neuro-Oncology, um, as well as advisory board positions for the National Brain Tumor Society, the Society for Neuro-Oncology, and the Sontag Foundation. Um, and on top of this, he's also co-founder and scientific advisor for Tronto Therapeutics. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will hand over to you, Frank, um, to share your screen and take it away. I will mute myself. Hey, thank you so much, Lucy. That was an extremely kind uh, introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Really nice to be here. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, can you see my slides? Presentation mode? Yes. Yeah. Great, 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 great. And um, well, once again, thank you. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about today is um, a project that we've had now ongoing for a couple of years where we're looking at uh, P10 nuclear function and its role in providing radio resistance in glioma. And I, I like to think of subtext for particular titles. And so the subtext of this uh, presentation is the whimsical uh, um, statement here is novel function of P10 in the nucleus. What's a nice lipid phosphatase doing in a place like this? And so um, as, as Lucy alluded to, my work, uh, my lab has worked on glioblastoma for, for many years now, not only glioblastoma, but other adult and pediatric uh, brain tumors. But uh, the focus of this presentation will be from the direction of glioblastoma. And for those who may not know uh, much about GBM, I'll just provide a couple of bullet points here. And this is the most common and aggressive primary malignant brain tumor uh, in adults. It's actually accounts for 50%, greater than 50% of all primary brain tumors. Um, and in terms of a cell of origin, I, I think now the, uh, the jury's actually still out, but there's a considerable amount of data uh, illustrating that an OPC-like 
uh, cell is, uh, could generate um, high-grade gliomas. In terms of numbers of patients who uh, have a GBM per year or are diagnosed with GBM, if you add the US and the EU together, it's about 25,000 cases, 25,000 cases per year. So that doesn't really seem like a lot of uh, cancer incidents when you compare it to other uh, uh, more prevalent cancers like lung and, 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 um, and uh, breast cancer. But suffice it to say, it's an extremely lethal cancer. The uh, prognosis is typically about 14 months on average. And we, we really don't know much in terms of risk factors. We know that uh, Caucasians and Asians slightly higher than other populations, males slightly higher than females. Um, and, and really, this, this is the state of therapeutic, uh, therapeutics for GBM patients. This is the STOOP protocol, uh, which came out in 2005. And uh, what, what Roger did was to include the alkylating agent temozolomide to radiation therapy. And you can see that is that led to about a month or so extension in survival. So this is really where, this, where the uh, state of therapy is for GBM patients. And so we and, and many others have really tried to answer the question, why is this cancer so difficult to treat? And I think there's really, we could point to four main reasons for this. It has very limited response to traditional and targeted therapy, I showed you traditional therapy on the previous slide, targeted therapy, uh, although we have great epitopes or, or targets such as EGF receptor, uh, these uh, approaches have largely been ineffective. These tumors are highly heterogeneous, both inter and intratumoral heterogeneity. Uh, the tumor is extremely invasive, so surgery can never cure a GBM. And there's no early detection like we have for other cancer types. And so uh, my lab, we, we work on these uh, three top bullet points. And what I'll tell you about today is I'll focus on how we can possibly enhance uh, traditional therapy for GBM patients, that being ionizing radiation or, or, re or therapies that e evoke uh, DNA damage. And we've come about this initially from the perspective of the two most commonly altered genes in GBM, those being the epidermal growth factor receptor and the P10 tumor suppressor gene. And we know um, that these are highly uh, mutated as indicated here, or in the case of EGFR, highly amplified and um, with additional mutations such as structural or, um, or uh, alterations in this sense mutations. But not only are these two genes highly implicated in GBM, but they're intimately linked. So this is just a very brief primer on uh, EGF receptor signaling. It signals through two major uh, downstream pathways, RASMAP kinase pathway, as well as the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. And by uh, virtue of signaling, in this case, I've just cartooned EGFR and EGFR V3, which is a deleted version of uh, EGFR found in about 25% of GBM patients. Uh, this leads to activation of PI3 kinase generates PIP3, uh, which is a second messenger uh, lipid substrate for AKT, which then leads to survival growth and proliferation. And the P10 tumor suppressor gene which has a canonical function in the cytosol as a lipid phosphatase, reverts or blunts this activation of AKT, reverts it back to PIP2, takes PIP3 and reverts it back to PIP2. So P10 is a, is a critical molecule for suppressing AKT activation. Now we also know that P10 has protein phosphatase activity, but it's, uh, those functions are less well uh, understood. And so given the links between these two proteins, uh, there, there has been a considerable effort trying to target uh, EGF receptor with small molecules, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is the initial uh, uh, clinical trial back in 2005 by Ingo Mellenhoff, where, uh, where he saw all, that only about 10 to 20% of GBM patients had a response to EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Really, and, and this was quite surprising, despite having high levels 
of amplification of EGFR or EGFR B3 or other uh, mutated versions of the receptor. And what, what was very obvious from his genomic analysis was that those patients who responded the best were those where P10 was intact. In other words, when you block the receptor signaling, P10 could um, further suppress this pathway and prevent AT AKT activation. So those patients who were wild type for P10 uh, tended to progress in about 10 months on uh, time to progression was about 10 months on therapy. And in contrast, those patients where P10 was mutated, uh, they had no response. So that was pretty uh, understandable. But when you look closely at the data, as we did, we saw that about four to 11% of the patients, even though they had wild type P10 expression, they demonstrated upfront resistance. So why wasn't P10 functioning uh, in this case? Why were these patients no, uh, not susceptible or uh, responsive to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors? And so we reasoned that perhaps there was some post-translational modification on P10 that was inactivating its activity. Uh, this was not really a stretch of the imagination. There is a, a number of pathways as shown here that both activate and inhibit uh, P10 activity. Uh, but there's been one uh, particular mechanism, that being SARC uh, family kinases, which has been shown in a clinical setting to actually alter uh, P10's activity. And this is in the uh, breast cancer um, setting. And this is work out of MD Anderson, where they showed that breast cancers, which were HER2 new positive or ERB2 positive, uh, this uh, leads to activation of SARC, which then phosphorylates P10. And when this occurs, what they showed in their study is P10 was mobilized away from the cell membrane, so away from its lipid substrate, and this allowed for AKT to be uh, active. Uh, when you treat uh, breast cancer cells with trastuzumab, or otherwise known as Herceptin, this shuts off the receptor, SARC is silenced, and then P10 can be reactivated in blunt PI3, PI3 uh, kinase AKT signaling. And what they found in the clinical setting was that these patients, even though they were being treated with Herceptin, they were also being treated with erythropoietin, which to, uh, um, to, to help them cope with their anemia. And what was occurring is that erythropoietin was leading to the activation of SARC, which then me uh, meant that Herceptin was less effective. And in a follow-up study, they showed that if they blocked SARC activation with dasatinib, uh, this restored uh, trastuzumib sensitivity. So this was a really uh, nice indication that uh, P10 could be post-translationally modified or its activity could be commandeered by a post-translational modification. And so a postdoc in my lab at the time, Tim Fenton, who's now a faculty member of the University of Southampton, decided to ask the question, well, do GBM patients who did not respond to EGF receptor inhibitors, but yet are wild type for P10 expression, were they being, uh, was P10 being inactivated in some way by SARC? And so he mapped phosphorylation sites for SARC on P10, both in vitro and in vivo, so both biochemically as well as uh, cells expressing SARC. And he identified six tyrosine sites specifically phosphorylated by this RTK, I'm sorry, by this tyrosine kinase. And um, he decided to focus on one of these, tyrosine 240. And really the, the simple reason for that was that tyrosine 240 was conserved um, throughout evolution. So we wanted to put our energy into one of these sites. Uh, we made a polyclonal antibody. Uh, we were able to audit uh, phosphorylation of P10 in clinical samples, such as shown here and we can block its, uh, this antibody with a phospho-240 uh, uh, peptide, so you completely eliminate uh, detection with our polyclonal. So we, we had some good reagents in hand to study the role of tyrosine-240 and to see if it had any mechanism in providing resistance to EGFR TKI. So uh, the initial um, objectives were the following. Does tyrosine-240 have a role in clinical behavior? 
Does it predict response? Is it an indicator of prognosis for GBM patients? Um, so the first thing we did was to consult and collaborate with Paul Michel while he was at UCLA. He had a panel of GBM patient samples uh, that were typed uh, for P10 expression. And of the ones which were P10 positive, we detected phosphorylation of P10 in 82%, so 27 out of 33 cases. Uh, this is an this uh, here is a tumor microarray, and you can see quite nicely the heterogeneity that exists in these tumors, where this portion of the tumor is devoid of P10 expression. You could see it in this um, uh, region here, and that was also phosphorylation positive, so phospho 240 positive, and also expressed. Uh, active SARC as shown there. So the two co-registered phosphorylation of P10 and, and activation of SARC uh, in these samples. Um, so he went back and we, we looked at the non-responders in that clinical trial, and there was really good statistical correlation for the presence of phospho-240 as shown here and the presence of phospho-SARC. Uh, and, and the numbers were um, somewhat small, but statistically relevant. And uh, as you can see here in the responders, so these are also P10 positive, um, they are uh, not phospho 240 positive or active, or, excuse me, have active SARC. Um, since this study, uh, we, we know that P10 is phosphorylated not only by SARC family kinases, but FGF receptors and a variety of other tyrosine kinases. I'm really gonna focus quite a bit on FGF receptor today for the very reason that this receptor is extremely specific uh, for the tyrosine 240 site. It only phosphorylates that site. But I'll, I'll just finish some data here that we have with SARC. Uh, what we did uh, also see was that there was a trend in those patients. So I mentioned that on these patients on therapy, uh, 10 months on, uh, on average time to progression, we were able to get some pre-treatment and post-treatment samples from uh, a small group of individuals, uh, actually eight. And we saw a slight trend that in the relapse situation uh, that there was elevated P10 phosphorylation and elevated SARC. Um, Tim went on to see if this uh, phosphorylation of P10 provided a mechanism of resistance to uh, EGFR TKI. So he took mouse astrocytes, which were P10 deleted, uh, engineered them with EGFRV3 um, to make them sensitive to drug, and then reconstituted with wild type P10 or a mutant of P10 where he just uh, mutated tyrosine 240 to phenylalanine to block the phosphorylation. So this is a mutation that we use, I'll be using throughout my uh, presentation. And he treated these cells with tyrosine kinase inhibitor allotinib. And it looked at uh, relative uh, viability. And you can see in the bars here where we uh, reconstituted with wild type P10, there was really little, if any, uh, sensitivity to drug. But when P10 was uh, not uh, uh, competent for phosphorylation on that site, uh, there was uh, considerable sensitivity to drug. So blocking the ability to phosphorylate P10 on that site clearly uh, led to greater sensitivity to allotinib. But here's where things kind of went sideways. We, we expected that the phosphorylation of P10 would eliminate its lipid phosphatase activity and we would have elevated AKT in the cells. So looking at astrocytes in which he uh, re expressed either empty vector or constitutively active SARC, uh, and then reconstituted with wild type P10 or Y240F, what we found was that AKT was very uh, robustly suppressed still upon P10 expression in the face of constitutive SARC activity. In this first lane here, this is no P10. You can see AKT is, um, is um, phosphorylated on serine 473. So uh, for some reason, we don't really know yet why, um, at least in the um, astrocyte models and and other models that I'll show you, this phosphorylation site does not inhibit P10's uh, lipid phosphatase activity. So this is where, you know, you sit back and you start to think, you know, maybe we're looking under the wrong street light. And, you know, as scientists, we tend to look under the street light because that's where the light is brightest or that's where we're most comfortable 
doing our experiments. And so Tim being very, very uh, um, smart, he decided to look at the clinical data. And what he found was when we, when we looked at a panel of GBM patients, and these patients are P10 positive, and they're, they're treated with standard of care therapy, ionizing radiation and temozolomide. So there's 40 patients and he, we stained for a phosphorylation on P10. And we saw a very good correlation with poor uh, survival. So when P10 was phosphorylated on tyrosine 240, as shown here, the median survival was six months. And when it was not phosphorylated, or we could not detect it in the, in the samples, the median survival was 12 months. So this was suggestive to us that perhaps there's a unique function of phosphor 240P10, and maybe it had a role in uh, repairing uh, um, DNA damage. Now, you know, I mentioned that P10 has this canonical function in the cytosol, but it also has uh, a num numerous functions within the nucleus. We call these non-canonical functions. And many of these have to do with the integrity of uh, DNA. Uh, but one paper caught our eye, and this was by Vuk Stembolik's lab at the University of Toronto. And what he showed was that when P10 was deleted from uh, glioma cells, they, were, they had elevated uh, double strand breaks. And upon reconstitution of P10, uh, this enhanced the repair of double strand breaks. And so we, we came up with the, the uh, possibility or hypothesis that perhaps the phospho 240 signal on P10 was a mediator of this process. Maybe this was a trigger or a switch to enhance double strand breaks. This was needed to enhance double strand breaks. Uh, and so the first thing we did was to look very closely at uh, clinical samples for the location of phospho 240. And you can see here in these GBM patients, uh, is very uh, clearly localized to the nucleus. The entire pool, it seems, is in the nucleus. Uh, and we, we also have antibodies that detect, you know, that are specific for PAN, uh, P10, and it's everywhere within the cell. And we could recapitulate this result using uh, U87 cells in which we expressed wild type P10 plus uh, SARC, either wild type or Y240F. And you can see here that when we stain with our phospho 240 antibody, uh, the signal is completely uh, within the nucleus, and this is in contrast with a, with a, a tag um, on a P10 flag. You can see here is with, throughout the entire cell. And we also saw the same results with FGF receptor expressing cells, and that's actually uh, shown on this data. These are the 293T cells in which we uh, transduced with FGF receptor 2, uh, along with either wild type P10 or, or the YF mutant and then partition the cells or fractionate the cells into cytosolic and nuclear fractions. And you can see that the amount of P10 that's in the nucleus is very small, but stoichiometrically, it is very heavily phosphorylated or the, the very abundantly phosphorylated on tyrosine 240 when you compare it to the pool that's in the cytosol shown here. So um, the phosphorylation of P10 on 240 seems to be robustly present uh, within the nucleus. And so based on this, Tim uh, set out to address the following questions. Um, is phosphor 240 P10 linked to radio, I'm sorry, Tim and a follow-up uh, postdoc, Jean-Louis Ma, who I'll uh, introduce you to in a minute, uh, decided to ask, is the phosphorylation of P10 linked to radio resistance and glioma? Uh, how does this regulate P10 function? And can we actually target this mechanism to improve therapeutic efficacy? That's the goal here, is to try to enhance radiation for GBM patients and perhaps other uh, cancer types where this mechanism is being employed. And so, as I mentioned, uh, this, this work is, was handed off uh, to Jean-Mi Ma, an extremely talented postdoc in the lab. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you a lot of the data that we published um, a couple of years ago now in cancer cell. And so the first question that Jean-Louis Ma uh, decided to ask is, is there an inverse correlation between the presence of 240 phosphorylation and the presence of double strand breaks in clinical samples? So we looked at 19 GBM samples. Uh, we looked for double strand breaks by uh, phospho H2AX staining. 
and for the presence of phosphor 240 p10 and there was a, a very nice inverse correlation so the more phosphor 240 there was in these samples the let the the less we saw of the marker of double strand break uh, phospho h2ax and this was also uh, a similar in um in, in a clonogenic assay uh, with colleagues, Eric Suman and John DeGroote, where we looked at a panel, a 43 panel, a, a panel of 43 glioma neurospheres for their sensitivity to ionizing radiation. And we saw a, a pretty, pretty significant correlation with if P10 was being expressed, uh, those that had uh, FGF receptor uh, 2 expression were resistant to therapy or ionizing radiation and where FGF receptor expression was low, uh, they were sensitive. Uh, this is some of those lines. Um, these three here are the resistant lines and you can see they had FGFR2 and these here had very low levels of FGFR2. Uh, and uh, this correlated quite well with the presence, notable presence of P10 in the nucleus where it was uh, considerably lower in the sensitive uh, lines. And so John, we said, well, can I, can I mimic this in um, U87 cells, uh, which are P10 null. Um, he or she expressed FGF receptor along with either wild type or the YF uh, P10, and then treated it with ionizing radiation and, did, and looked at survival by clonogenic assay. Uh, and, and clearly uh, P10 does indeed get phosphorylated in these reconstituted cells. And it's that condition that led to the greatest number of surviving colonies uh, the YF mutant is, is severely compromised. And if we leave out FGF receptor 2, you can see it doesn't matter if the wild type is there, those cells are also compromised and um, succumb to ionizing radiation. Uh, we've uh, pursued the actual uh, DNA repair process here. So we first did a neutral comet assay. This is looking at the length or the comet, um, the tail moment see here in vector transfected U87 cells treated with 10 gray radiation at 24 hours. This is the, this is the control, the length or the presence of uh, double strand breaks or so the amount of double strand breaks in these cells that are electrophoresis through agar. And that is comparable to the YF transfected cells, but we see a, a much shorter um, tail moment in the wild type transfected cells indicating uh, they are better adept at repairing their double strand breaks in this neutral comet assay. Uh, we use the traffic light assay to dissect whether this is through homologous recombination or non-homologous end joining. We did two different reporters here. A GFP repair would be indicative of HR and uh, M cherry repair would be indicative of non-homologous end joining. First, if you look on the right, uh, there was no difference in uh, NHEJ as shown here. However, uh, homologous recombination was compromised in the YF expressing, uh, in this case was U2OS cells. So the mechanism um, appears to be homo predominantly homologous recombination mediated by wild type P10. And we also looked at uh, 53 BP1 and we actually saw no difference as well uh, for the non-homologous end joining um, function. So uh, HR seems to be uh, the mechanism. We then went on to look at the repair uh, kinetics uh, by foci analysis of gamma H2AX. And you can see here that um, U87 cells treated with 10 gray radiation, uh, those cells with wild type and YF uh, responded equally well to, uh, in, in terms of foci number. Um, wild type cells restore or go back to baseline or repair their DNA by about 24 hours but the YF cells are, have persistent double strand breaks at that time point. Looking at RAD51 loading, uh, we see uh, that there's inefficient loading in the Y240F uh, expressing cells. So this might be an indication of poor filament uh, formation. Uh, looking at the, uh, the signaling process of DNA repair, uh, if you look at ATM, uh, phospho ATM, the first kinase activated down from the double strand breaks, you can see that it's equally activated in both wild type and YF cells. Uh, and um, however, we see a persistence of phospho ATM in the YF cells, which tracks with the persistence of the double strand break monitored by phospho gamma H2AX shown here. Once again, the wild type cells, they repair their DNA uh, by about 24 hours post 10 gray radiation. <clears throat> 
So just to summarize very quickly here, so far, what I've shown you, at least genetically, if we block uh, 240 phosphorylation, we have persistent DNA damage. There's inefficient repair. Uh, RAD51 uh, loading on the chromatin seems to be non-productive and other parameters um, as shown here are normal. I didn't show you all the data. That's all that's in the paper if you want to have a look. Um, so in the process of doing these experiments, we asked the question, does P10 actually bind to chromatin? And what we found was quite uh, interesting that the wild type P10 has uh, definitely binds to chromatin and upon radiation, that binding seems to be enhanced. However, the YF uh, mutant does not or is significantly compromised for binding to chromatin. In addition to this, we looked at the chromatin state and this, these are just preliminary experiments, but we see that H3K9 trimethylation, which is a marker of heterochromatin, um, is actually considerably decreased in cells expressing wild type P10 especially with uh, radiation. And we don't see this for uh, the Y240F mutant. So this indicates that the chromatin is a more relaxed state uh, when P10 uh, is, is bound to chromatin. Uh, and this, was, uh, this result was complemented by doing mycococcal uh, assay, where you see the uh, laddering of nucleosomes or the indication of uh, more relaxed chromatin in the wild type uh, cells, but not in the YF cells. So I showed you ge uh, genetically that this phosphorylation of uh, tyrosine 240 seems to be important for DNA repair. If we block it pharmacologically, do we see the same effect? So here uh, using U87 cells treated with DMSO or an FGF receptor inhibitor, uh, PD173074, we looked at DNA binding, I'm sorry, P10 binding to chromatin. You can see once again, P10 binds to chromatin very well, um, enhanced after radiation. But we don't see that when we block with an FGF receptor inhibitor. And we also don't see the loading of RAD51 uh, as shown uh, on the right. And this also tracks with persistence of double strand breaks. So just blocking uh, the FGF receptor pathway with this tool compound can enhance sensit sensitivity to um, ionizing radiation in cells expressing wild type P10. Next, uh, we turn to more representative models of, of GBM using glioma neurospheres, which were genotyped for P10 and FGF receptor 2. HK281 is P10 null, uh, but it expresses endogenous levels of FGF receptor 2. And you can see that it's indeed phosphorylated on tyrosine 240 when we reconstituted with wild type P10. Uh, and here's the mutant control. When we look by limiting dilution assay, you can see on the right that all three of these uh, conditions, vector, wild type, or the F mutant, have the same ability to form colonies uh, by the LDA um, approach. However, upon radiation, the YF and the, and the vector control are severely compromised for forming colonies. And this tracks with the inability to repair double strand breaks. So there's persistent breaks in the vector and there's persistent breaks in the YF uh, HK281 reconstituted cells out to 24 hours, which we don't see in the wild type cells. If we engraft the wild type in the Y240F cells or the topically into nod skin animals and look at survival, we see there's absolutely no difference. However, just a single dose of ionizing radiation, this is five gray, there is a survival advantage uh, for, the, for the mice that uh, were, were engrafted with the YF P10 expressing cells. So there's an extension of survival. So they are, um, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, more sensitive, YF cells are more sensitive to ionizing radiation. Looking at uh, the TS528 glioma neurosphere line, which has endogenous wild type P10 and FGF receptor 2, when these cells are grown in uh, stem cell conditions, in this case, we, we use basic FGF, you can see that P10 is indeed phosphorylated on tyrosine 240. If we block that phosphorylation by, by just leaving out ligand or using the PD173074 tool compound, yeah, I'm sorry, you block the phosphorylation in both of those cases. 
But when we look at um, colony formation in a limiting dilution assay, all three of these growth conditions uh, were more or less identical. However, upon radiation, um, there is a significant um, de uh, difference for those cells where FGF receptor was not signaling. And this, once again, correlates with sustained double strand breaks uh, when we uh, leave out or block uh, the FGF receptor pathway. Here on the left is the rescue experiment with FGF, and you can see that they um, repair their double strand breaks quite readily. So hopefully by this time, you're wondering if this at all has to do with P10's lipid phosphatase activity. And so looking back 24 years when I was a postdoc, I analyzed a number of mutant alleles of P10 that were found in GBM, uh, cervical cancer, a number of different types of cancers. And uh, the initial analysis that I did showed that they were all compromised for lipid phosphatase activity. So we picked a couple of these. I'll just show you the data for G129R and, and ask the question, is it also compromised for DNA repair? Uh, first of all, G129R, when you express it in cells, also gets phosphorylated on tyrosine 240, binds to chromatin quite well, is, is enhanced for binding upon radiation treatment, and to our, our surprise, uh, was able to enhance the repair of double strand breaks as shown here. So within 24 hours, much like the wild type reconstituted cells, G129R could uh, restore to baseline. Uh, we don't see that for Y240F. So this would indicate that the lipid phosphatase activity of P10 was dispensable for DNA repair. Uh, looking at foci analysis, gamma H2AX, RAD51, wild type and G129R were indistinguishable in terms of their kinetics of, of foci formation and the degree of force foci formation. Uh, if you do a clonogenic assay, however, um, yes, we do see the same result. Wild type and G129R gave the same number of colonies uh, surviving after radiation. But when you look at the size of the colonies in, in the G129R state, they're about two times bigger than the wild type cells, uh, reconstituted cells. And I think this really points to the, the separation of cytosolic versus nuclear function of P10. In the cytosol, this G129R mutant uh, does not block uh, AKT activation because it's enzymatically dead. And that's uh, just validated here. So G129R um, expressing cells have elevated levels of activated AKT, whereas wild type and YF do not. So um, the lipid phosphatase activity of P10 is, is dispensable for this process, but within the cytosol, um, there is a uh, inhibition of its activity uh, to control the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. So ultimately we wanna turn this into a, a therapeutic. Can we, can we move this towards a clinical trial? And so to do this, uh, we started uh, with a pharmacodynamic analysis to see when maximally P10 phosphorylation was eliminated after administration of an FGF receptor inhibitor. Here we turn to AZD4547, which is a pan FGF receptor inhibitor is blood brain barrier, it can penetrate the blood brain barrier. Um, we, we set up animals which, uh, with a TS528 orthotopic engraftment. Uh, here I show you six animals, uh, each, with an ind each individually having a, 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 an engrafted tumor, uh, treated with a single gavage of 50 mg per kilogram of AZD. And we sacrificed these animals over time as shown here, precipitated P10 from the tumors and looked for phosphorylation of 240. And what you can see here is we saw a maximal decrease of 240 signal at four hours, and then it restored at eight hours. So the hypothesis that was generated from this was that this is our window of opportunity to treat these animals with ionizing radiation, and we should be able to extend survival. Uh, so that's the experiment that John Lee set up. We uh, engrafted the same line orthotopically, and at day 12, we treated with drug, uh, 
followed by radiation at either two hours or four hours post-drug. And we did this over three consecutive days. We looked at tumor burden. And you can see here on the right, this, this is by fluorescence molecular tomography. You can see that four hours post-drug gave us the greatest decrease in tumor burden, uh, which translates into an extension in survival. We see a moderate extension in survival uh, for the two hour time point, but significant survival at the four hour time point of radiation administered after AZD gabage. And this was done uh, with several um, glioma uh, neurosphere lines. Here's a second one here on the right. The results are, are essentially identical. So AZD 4547 sensitizes to radiation uh, at the precise time point in, this, in, in these clinical models. We've vetted several other uh, FGF receptor inhibitors as shown here, and we've, we've kind of interested right now in this one from Taiho Pharmaceuticals called TAS120. It's a pan FGF receptor inhibitor, irreversible, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and has really good ability to block P10 phosphorylation out to 24 hours. We need to do this experiment and go further and see when we detect phosphorylation again. But I think this widens the window of vulnerability to radiation. And so we're currently pursuing uh, these experiments. But I have to point out that FGF receptor in inhibition does indeed have adverse effects in people. And I've listed them here. So I'm gonna circle back later to are some of our current thoughts that we're doing in parallel with FGFR inhibitors, where we're actually looking for ways to disrupt P10 from binding to chromatin uh, using small peptides. And I'll, I'll tell you about that data at the very end. So we next wanted to know if this phosphorylation event of P10 was important for, for whole body homeostasis or some other features uh, of a developing organism. And so we made a knock-in animal. So here is a knock-in showing homozygote knock-in of Y240F. Uh, we cross these animals onto INC, INC4A ARF uh, null locus. And we first thing we did was to look at the MEFs from these animals. And we didn't see any difference in downstream signaling. So at least we knew that the phosphorylation or the blocking the phosphorylation really didn't change these uh, cell, cell survival and, and proliferation pathways. And that really wasn't a surprise because we had done biochemical assays before with y, the YF mutant and we didn't see any effect on AKT phosphorylation. Secondly, these mice seem to be phenotypically normal. So they developed normal, they age normally. So there was really no adverse um, effect due to the knock-in mutation. So we decided to take astrocytes from these animals and convert them into being tumorigenic by expressing EGFRV3, and then engraft these animals into uh, not skid animals to look at survival after radiation. So in other words, can the single residue, a single amino acid change at endogenous levels lead to a sensitization to radiation? And the answer to that question is yes. So wild type uh, engrafted uh, animals or astrocytes with wild type P10 uh, treated with radiation at two and a half grade times three fractions were no different than unirradiated mice or the YF irradiated mice. It's only when we uh, treat the animals that had the YF mutation with radiation do we see an extension in survival. So this is like one of those, my all time favorite experiments. We have a single amino acid change in P10 at, at the endogenous levels and genetically we can prove that it provides sensitization to radiation. Uh, these animals are overall sensitive to uh, radiation. We've looked in a couple of compartments, uh, post whole body irradiation, we looked in the gut, uh, this is the proximal small intestine and we see a defect in uh, villi uh, reconstitution post-radiation in the YF cells, and we see a delay in uh, proliferation. And there's a considerable amount of P10 phosphorylation occurring in the, um, in the crypts uh, of the villi shown here. So we think that this mouse might be a good indicator 
animal for where 240 phosphorylation is important. And we're, we're actually pursuing those questions now. So there's really nothing about P10 that suggests it's a DNA binding protein. Uh, there's no motifs that we are able to detect. So we, we wanted to identify how P10 was being re recruited to chromatin. So we did a, a mass spec uh, analysis using SILAC uh, approach. And we found that there was one protein that's specifically bound to P10 and that is KI67. Uh, we did the typical due diligence experiments. We did reciprocal immunoprecipitations. If you precipitate P10 uh, or, or G129R, uh, we, we bring down uh, 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 KI67 as shown here, not the YF uh, P10. And if you precipitate KI67, uh, once again, YF fails to form a complex um, um, with P10 as shown here. So KI67 seem to be forming a complex. If we knock down KI67 with two different uh, SI approaches, uh, we decrease the amount of P10 that's binding to chromatin. Now, uh, we were able to get a number of KI67 constructs from David Gerlich's lab. Uh, this is a very large protein, and, and luckily uh, he had several constructs which allowed us to map precisely where P10 was binding on KI67. And um, very, very simply put, the binding of P10 was mapping to uh, the PP1 binding domain or the protein phosphatase 1 uh, binding uh, domain. So construct number four, uh, which lacks PP1 binding domain, uh, lacks um, a P10 association, where number three, uh, where that's retained, we can clearly co-IP uh, P10. Uh, just some further uh, illustration that PP1 binding domain was essential uh, using these three constructs. Uh, number uh, seven, where we shuffled the sequence in the PP1 binding domain that lacked P10 binding. However, number eight is able to pull down P10, bind, uh, P10 as shown here. Now you might say, why is it such a uh, why, why is that such a um, the signal so poor? Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, because we didn't have the LR domain on this construct, that this um, construct of KI67 was not localized to the new to the chromatin as shown for other constructs, and so we think that maximal association of P10 with KI67 requires Ki67 to be anchored to chromatin. We can rescue the effect of knocking down Ki67. So here, number, uh, if we knock down Ki67, we reduce the amount of P10 that binds to chromatin. If we reconstitute these cells with, with construct number six, you see we have elevated P10 binding to chromatin. And if we uh, reconstitute with this disrupted PP1 binding domain construct, this leads to a decrease in chromatin association of P10. Uh, with colleague uh, Laura Oriana at the Science for Life Laboratory in Stockholm, we've pursued how P10 is binding uh, to Ki67 and what does the phosphorylation of P10 do to the structure of P10. We know that the phosphorylation of P10 occurs in the C2 domain at this tyrosine 240, but this did not seem to be the binding site based on um, um, IP experiments uh, for KI67. But what we do think is occurring is that the phosphorylation of this site causes a slight conformational change, uh, causing the phosphatase domain at the end terminus to open up slightly. Um, and in sim uh, uh, simulation uh, analyses done by Laura, uh, she showed that the PP1 binding domain uh, would actually dock within uh, this uh, protein, um, sorry, the phosphatase domain of P10. That's this region right here. And this was the same region of PP1 gamma uh, that binds uh, to uh, Ki67. So the same region on Ki67 and the same structural domain on PP1 gamma is protein phosphatase domain uh, seem to be where uh, these two proteins uh, came together. Now, um, PP1 gamma and P10 have very little um, sequence conservation, but they have structural conservation within the protein 
within their phosphatase domain. So we think that might have uh, a significant reason why these two proteins can bind uh, Ki67 and bind the same region on Ki67. So this was shown in molecular dynamic simulations uh, where uh, the, this, the PP1 binding domain would, uh, would uh, integrate within the phosphatase domain of P10 as well as uh, PP1 gamma. So this is just a close-up of the region of P10 uh, with the uh, PP1 binding domain um, within it. It's like kind of, uh, this, this ribbon uh, that, uh, that goes through this region of the phosphatase domain. It is a 32 amino acid stretch consisting of an RVXF region and a Kerr slim region, which stands for Ki67 repo man small linear motif. Um, there's there's uh, evidence that um, when PP1 binding, uh, PP1 gamma binds uh, to this region that it's regulated by Aurora B kinase. So we're presently looking at whether that also regulates uh, P10's association. The fact that these two proteins, P10 and PP1 gamma, bind to the same region on Ki67 suggests that they may actually compete for the same for same binding. So we, we tested that using U87 cells expressing P10. Uh, we increased uh, PP1 gamma expression with, uh, by transfection as shown here. And with increasing PP1 gamma, we see a decrease in P10 binding to chromatin. If we precipitate Ki67, uh, we see the same thing, that there's a decrease in P10 uh, association while there's an increase in PP1 gamma uh, uh, binding. So this uh, leads us to think about perhaps there's other ways to dissociate P10 from chromatin other than an FGF receptor inhibitor, because as I, as I mentioned, FGF receptor inhibitors will, will have adverse effects in the, in the clinic. And so the proof of concept experiment is shown here. We made a peptide uh, that maps to the Kerr slim motif within PP1 gamma. Uh, I'm sorry, within PP within Ki67. So here's the wild type peptide, and then we made a, a, a control, a, a mutant peptide, in which we uh, changed the charge of several residues, and we transfected these into cells to look at could we block P10 and Ki67 binding. The wild type peptide does indeed lead to a decrease in binding, whereas the, the mutant peptide uh, does not. And so what does this mean in terms of radiation sensitivity? Well, the wild type uh, peptide, because it disrupts the association between the two proteins, uh, seems to allow uh, for radiation to be more effective and we have persistent double-strand breaks, whereas the mutant peptide, which does not disrupt the association, does not. So we think that we might be able to design peptides that can disrupt P10 from uh, Ki67. So the question is, can we design them in such a way that we, dis that we disrupt P10 only and not PP1 gamma? Because PP1 gamma is essential for exit of mitosis. And so uh, a, a very talented post, I'm sorry, student in my lab, uh, Brandon Jones, decided to do an alanine scan of the uh, PP1 binding domain as shown here. So he made a series of peptides that span this region and each peptide, he changed one amino acid to alanine. Uh, he he um, used lysates, which, which expressed P10. And in individual lysates, he put in one peptide uh, that was tagged with biotin. And he asked the questions, which, which of these mutations disrupt P10 binding and which ones disrupt PP1 gamma? And the results are shown here. And we found very clearly that there are residues in this PP1 binding region that specifically disrupt P10. For example, these first four residues, if you change any one of these to an alanine, completely disrupt P10 binding, but do not disrupt PP1 gamma, and vice versa. We had residues down here that uh, did not disrupt uh, P10, but disrupted uh, PP1 gamma. And we even had residues that when they were mutated to alanine, enhanced binding to P10 and completely disrupted PP1 gamma. Um, so this leads us uh, to be somewhat optimistic 
that we might be able to make a peptide uh, that can disrupt one protein versus the other. And uh, we're currently doing those experiments to see if we can convey radiation sensitivity. And so I'm just gonna leave you with the following thoughts. Um, I, I now think of P10 of having both a tumor suppressive role and an oncogenic role in cancer. Uh, and this would play out over um, three scenarios in, in terms of thinking about personalized therapy. In a scenario where P10 is wild type, as I showed you, if P10 is indeed phosphorylated on tyrosine 240, uh, this promotes its binding to KI67 and enhances RAD51 loading onto double strand breaks. So how would one wanna treat such a clinical um, scenario? Well, here I would say that an FGF receptor inhibitor coupled with radiation would be effective. Alternatively, if we're successful at disrupting these two proteins with, with a peptide or a small molecule structured after the confirmation of the peptide, uh, this might be more effective and more specific. In a case where P10 is mutated, such as a lipid phosphatase and activating mutation, G129R, we know that it still provides this uh, enhancement of double strand break repair, but we also know from you know, decades of work that those mutants are um, defective for blocking AKT activation. So here, you would wanna block both with an FGF receptor inhibitor coupled with an AKT inhibitor or PI3 kinase inhibitor, treating these uh, patients with ionizing radiation. And then lastly, as shown by uh, uh, several groups, including Vuk Stambolic's lab, in the P10 deleted state, these cells are inherently sensitive to radiation. This has been shown in a couple of cancer types um, as prostate cancer comes to mind. Um, and here you would want to treat with radiation in combination with an AKT pathway inhibitor. Um, so with that, I just wanna come to the end here and acknowledge the, the fantastic people I have in my lab. This, this is our group picture. We try to do like a, a you know, Marvel Avenger pose type here uh, a couple of years ago before COVID. Um, but the, the, the people who really were outstanding for this work were Tim, jean uh Rachel, uh, my technician who generated the mouse model, Brandon Jones, who's taking over this project, looking at peptide, uh, using peptides to disrupt the interaction. And we have a series of collaborators um, as illustrated down here and uh, the funding sources. And with that, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, that was a great talk. Um, there we go. Um, while I'm waiting for questions, uh, so people can either put questions in the chat or they can raise their hands and I'll come to them individually. Um, but while we're waiting, um, I, was quite, I was interested in the physiology of it really. So, so FGF receptor is driving this phosphorylation event that's then le leading to this re relaxation of the chromatin but yep. also ability to load um, RAD51. Do you think that's got anything to do with like how uh, the, the role of FGF receptor in cell fate regulation? And so this might be some sort of mechanism. So if, you're, if FGF receptor is causing the cell to proliferate more, for instance, it might need to upregulate its DNA damage response. Uh, that's an excellent question. We, yeah, you know, so, right. So we, we should definitely look um, if there's any alteration in the cellular state or the differentiation capacity of the neurospheres that we're working with. I mean, we've, we definitely have an interest in that question from a variety of directions. We're looking at how GBM in particular, particularly kind of transitions between these cell states that you're probably familiar with a lot of the data Recently, they, they can switch from proneural to mesenchymal and, 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 and backwards. So yeah, uh, we, we haven't looked at that, but that's, that's definitely a superb question, whether this is a cell state associated or cell mm. uh, fate associated um, sensitivity mechanism. Have you, have you looked at sort of the heterogeneity of it? In, you said, when you showed the original um, staining, yeah. it looked quite heterogeneous, didn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And, and, but I guess you haven't looked at that in terms of different cell states or? We, 
we haven't. Um, we've tried to model it, actually. You know, we've kind of predicted that you're going to get a cell, because P10 is, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely mutated at a high percentage in GBM, but not every single cell is mutated. So we've, we've, we've done some cell mixing experiments with either wild type or G129R, G129R with YF, you know, and, and done some successive radiation experiments. And we can see a selection mm. um, for those cells which uh, have the capacity to be phosphorylated on P10, right? So no, no radiation, they, they all proliferate to the same degree. But if you do round after round, we see an, an enrichment uh, for those cells where P10 was phosphorylated. So I, I think that experiment um, is, is something that we really need to look more closely at in the patient samples. And as I showed, we only had a couple of the pre and post treatment. That's those, those patients are really hard to come by. I mean, this serial uh, collection of tissue. Um, but my prediction is that the heterogeneity of a P10 might resolve somewhat with radiation um, if this mechanism is is present yeah. in the tumor. You get an enrichment, yeah. Um, and in terms of like clinic clinically, have people looked at this with FGF receptor um, antagonists in, in patients? Um, they have not yet. So we, we're trying to set up a, a window trial with uh, colleagues at MD Anderson. John DeGroot and uh, Rebecca, um, I forgot her last name, uh, but we're, we're setting up a, a clinical trial there. And the patients that we're selecting are those, they're recurrent GBM patients, which express P10. Uh, and they're just, they're gonna treat with FGF receptor inhibitor. In our case, we're gonna use the TAS120 mm -hmm. inhibitor. That's a really potent one. And we'll look at P10 phosphorylation state um, right after surgery right after these patients are um, treated with that. Uh, so yeah, we're just in the initial stages of that. Exciting stuff. Thank you. Um, so uh, there's a question from Jamie. Do you wanna go ahead, Jamie? Great, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, so I was, I was wondering, so it looks like the, the P10 phosphorylation event is affecting the rate of um, double strand break repair yes. so is that what's the effect on the the fate of the cells is that mainly affecting cell death or or arrest or what's what's the actual like downstream consequences of that so yeah one of the reviewers of the paper asked us to look at that uh we we did cell cycle analysis and you know there's an equal block uh in cell proliferation uh, both the wild type and the YF cells, and then uh, the YFs are just slower to come out of that block. So there, there seems to be an arrest. Um, we, we have to really tease that part because I think that will tell us, you know, where in the cell cycle uh, phospho 240 is playing a, a major role in repair. I, I, I suspect it's at the very end of G2. Uh, I mean, homologous recombination can occur in G2 and in um, up to the very end of G2, very, very early stages of mitosis even. Uh, and, and that's when uh, PP1 gamma is not bound to um, KI67. Uh, PP1 gamma binds at the end of, of mitosis to exit mitosis. So we think there might be a trade-off um, of the two phosphatases on, on KI67. I see. And can I ask another question, a kind of more general question about therapeutic strategies? So, so this particular approach looks like, or sounds like then, it's basically slowing down the, the cells. They take a bit longer to recover after the, the radiation damage. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think the relative merits of that kind of strategy of, of inhibiting DNA repair or slowing down DNA repair are versus like a strategy which increases the, the amount of DNA damage? So we really, right. So I, I don't know. So we really need to do a, a very precise analysis 
um, are we getting an accumulation of DNA, a DNA um, lesions in the Y240F? Do, do, is, do we see that there is an accumulation of um, mutations, right? That, that might be an effect here. I know non-homologous end joining would, if that particular mechanism was blocked, we would have much more mutations uh, arising, but uh, HR can also, I, I suppose, you can lead to enhanced um, mutations within the tumor, but a slower process. So I don't, I don't know the precise answer to your question. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks again for a great talk. And thank you, Jamie.